Data transfer objects, also known as DTOs, what are they good for and why should you use them? Hey everybody, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. If you're new to my channel, I cover topics around software architecture, design, and .NET. If you're interested in those, make sure to subscribe. So this topic came up around DTOs because uh, this tweet by Glenn that Christian replied to, that I replied to, which was wanting some good docs or tutorials explaining the thinking behind DTOs and web apps and why people use them. So Christian kind of gave the answer that really would be my answer as well, is controlling the inbound and outbound um, data that you're coming from your web app. Uh, and for big one for me, that means the representation, what the representation is of the data that you're taking in and the data that you're exposing. And the key thing here is you want those to be separate from your internals because you don't want to leak that internal, any of that internal structure in terms of data structures that you have because you want to be able to change those. And you don't want to kind of break your clients because once you kind of expose, if you're creating a web API, HTTP API, and you're serializing to JSON, for example, once you have clients using those structures, changing them can be problematic because you're gonna potentially break the client. So let's jump into some code and I'll give some examples here. All right, so I'm on the eShop on web project. I've used this in several of my other videos and live streams, doing some refactoring. So this is kind of like a demo e-commerce application. And what I'm looking at here is a particular controller that returns you your list of orders. So here is the, in this particular action, I have it two, doing two types of things. One is returning a, um, just a serialized version of this uh, response body. If it's JSON, it's gonna serialize it to JSON in the output. Otherwise it's gonna return the HTML view. So this view, HTML view looks like this. It just, um, if there are any orders, it iterates over them and kind of prints out uh, just this list of items. So that looks like this. I just created one order. Here's the information it's showing. So the key thing here though to point out is that there is no difference between this particular resource being represented in HTML, like we're viewing it here, or if I were to make this same call um, so this is this this is the actual HTML. This is what we are looking at. But if I make a call um, with this application JSON, we can get this this particular response here. Makes it a little bit bigger. Um, that is showing kind of the exact same thing. Just um, it's a different representation. This is the JSON representation, and the other one was the HTML representation. Now the key thing there for me is if there's no difference between uh, the two, it's just how you want to represent that resource, then why would you, for example, what to me is the, the thing to get away from the most is serializing what your data structures are, predominantly if you're using something like an ORM, where you end up serializing and outputting um, basically your entities that are associated to your ORM. That's what we want to avoid. So in this particular example, um, what we have is we are using a view model. And the reason being is that we're, I'm, I was using this as an example to show that this view model, again, it's the resource representation. It's this particular routes representation of the data that you get back. Now, why this is important is because this view model here, this one particular right here, which has this list of orders. This is a contract, right? So if you're exposing this particular JSON data to say our own clients, um, that'd be a little bit different than say public clients that we don't control. But once we kind of expose this data and clients start using the JSON data, they expect this structure. Like this is the contract. They expect this property, these arrays, um, this array. Uh, they expect the order number, the total, they will be using these values. We can't change this or can't change it easily anyways. So the idea being here is that if we create this view model, this ends up becoming our contract. This is what we 
you need to keep backwards compatible. Now, how we populate orders, for example, is done right here. And this is using Entity Framework. And we are creating a projection to use this order uh, summary view model. The alternative, the way this could have been done, which I don't recommend, is would have been using this orders um, this order directly, which is our base entity here, a part of entity framework. And the problem with that is, let's say, for example, we do a bunch of refactoring and we rename this very easily to something like uh, instead of buyer ID, we end up having customer ID and we do a refactor rename. It changes all of our code, no problem. The problem is if we were using this instead of our view model, all of a sudden we would have been changing that contract, which we do not want to do. So again, to, to emphasize this is you want to have contracts for what your inputs are and what your outputs are. That's why I avoid at all costs exposing internals. Don't expose things that you likely want to refactor later that are used um, probably in more places within your app that are easy to change, but you, you again, like I said, you can't change them because you have these decoupled clients that are using them. So that's the moral of why you want to use DTOs. If you enjoyed this video, let me know. This is a change of pace again where I, it's kind of a half and half between my live stream and a kind of a recorded edit, edited video. So let me know which one you perform more in the comments. If you have any comments about TTOs, again, let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching and hopefully I'll be putting another video shortly. Thanks. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and please subscribe for more software architecture related videos.